1909, a time before commercial air travel could even be conceived, with Orville and Wilbur Wright performing the first prolonged controlled flight with a heavier-than-air machine only six years earlier. The first gasoline-engine-powered car was built by Carl Benz in 1886, so only 23 years prior. The Model T was not mass-produced until 1908, making the first somewhat affordable vehicle to many people. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that to get from one side of the country to another, highways were not an option, at least not highways in the way that we think about them today. There was another type of highway, one made of steel tracks that was used to transport everything from coal to goods to people. And really, if you come to think about it, even once motor cars and highways became a thing, it would be decades before a family could really comfortably think about traveling via car all the way across the country or on long distance drives. And while many may see railroads as a somewhat carefree option because you don't have to worry about stopping, um, finding the actual location, you can even get up and stretch your legs while the train is still moving and possibly even be able to get a sleeper car. So it is a relaxing traveling experience to some people. But just like today, Mother Nature can take its toll on any type of transport. And in a time before radios and cell phones that would allow employees to quickly communicate before sensors that could detect where trains were, it was inevitable that tragedy would occur. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson, and I'll be your host as we explore the dark and winding paths that lead around the Delmarva Peninsula. If you're new here, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Delmarva is an area that encompasses all of Delaware, Maryland to the east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and Virginia to the north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Today, we will be exploring a train crash that took place in Del Mar in 1909. A slogan that Del Mar uses is that it's the town too big for one state. It is partially in Delaware and partially in Maryland. Logistically, this can sometimes cause problems with some residents having a Maryland zip code or address, but a Delaware phone number, even though with the advent of cell phones, that's becoming less and less of a problem. I've mentioned before that Delmarva feels like a whole community at times, and this can especially be seen in Del Mar as in times of need, even though there are different jurisdictions, people still come together. Before I get started today, let me just cover a few things I like to go over before each episode. With the type of content that I do cover, there usually is mention of incidents that some may find disturbing or troubling to hear about. In today's case specifically, there will be discussions of injury, death, and in at least one spot, a somewhat graphic description of the remains that are of one of the victims of this crash. So I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that. Also, I do use different sources to obtain information about each episode. As this case actually goes back to 1909, I did have to use some sources that um, were paid. So as usual, when I have to do that, which is becoming more and more frequent, I will put the link to the actual article that I referred to, but then also put the name of the newspaper and date so that if you have different ways to access them or a different um, site that you can use, then that will be available as well. Sometimes the sources can cost to use them. 
So if anybody would like to donate to you know, be able to keep some of the episodes going or types of episodes going, especially those that do go back further than just the last few years, um, I will have a PayPal link and a buy me a coffee link if anybody would like to add to that. And as usual, all of the sources and information will be linked in the description of the episode. Now, getting back to Del Mar in 1909, on February 22nd, it was a foggy night. Fog had started to encompass the southernmost part of Delaware, making travel of any kind somewhat hazardous. As an article on Delmarva now points out in its recollection of the event, fog could be hazardous to trains that were moving quickly. And let's face it, that was one of the biggest reasons for using a train is that it would move more quickly. When traveling by other means, such as horse and carriage, which was still you know, pretty prevalent at the time, it didn't have as much of an impact as a person would be going much slower and would have more time to assess the situation, even if fog was inhibiting how far they could see. The world really was in a transitional time where there were trains being used for mass transportation. There were some people who could afford cars and were beginning to use them. There were streetcars in some cities that passengers used to get around. And, you know, again, the horse and carriage as well. So there were so many different types of transportation being used. People really were kind of learning about them on the go. You know, so ways that we use to get about every day would seem completely alien to the people who were living in that time period. Now, trains were especially important for entertainers. Many traveling troops, whether they be circus or variety shows, traveled by rail. On this particular night, there was a troop of vaudeville performers. And if you have heard of other train crashes that happened around this time, you probably won't be surprised to hear that there were many animals traveling on the train to accompany the entertaining troops. On this particular train, there was a horse that could supposedly count, along with a myriad of other different skills. Reading about it made me think about Mr. Ed, the talking horse. And so with that reference, I'm probably dating myself a little. But in reading that, I almost wondered if this particular horse named Trixie was kind of a inspiration for the character of Mr. Ed. Now, understandably, the animals were not kept in among the sleeper cars or passenger quarters, but they were sent to the baggage car. So there were, was at least Trixie along with monkeys and, and dogs. And much to the chagrin of Trixie's trainer, he was also sent back there to spend the evening with the animals. There were also people traveling who were going to meet their loved ones. Sailors had been on a ship that had just traveled around the world, and they were going to meet their loved ones for the first time in over a year. On this particular night, then, more people than average had booked the train. In fact, the Norfolk-bound steel horse was actually split up into different sections, the train had left Philadelphia at around 11.20 p.m. To give you an idea of the distance, if you were to drive that route by car now, depending on how fast you drove, you could probably make it between two and two and a half hours. Myself, we would, well, I would probably be getting closer to the two and a half hours, if not longer. My husband would probably be closer to two hours, and I have actually made it there in an hour and a half with someone else driving because they were late for a carpool to the airport. This train bound for Nor Norfolk then had left Wilmington after going through Philadelphia at a few minutes past midnight. As we proceed with information about the crash, there will be discussion about both parts of the train. They were both called the number Nor. 
um, number 49 or the Norfolk Express. So in order to differentiate the train that was going to arrive earlier at the railway yard, I'm going to refer to as the first number 49. The train that was involved in the incident we're talking about today will be referred to as the accident train as I just want to make it clear as to which train I'm talking about. So at around 2.50 a.m., the second or accident train was approaching Del Mar. At this time, there were two locomotives sitting on the main line to the track. These were engines that would be attached to one of the two sections to transport each car or each set of cars down to Salisbury before they switched the setup again. I know it sounds like a complicated process. So with these two locomotives sitting on the main line, the first number 49 was redirected to a side track so that it could await to be attached to one of the locomotives. Initially, the workers of the rail yard were expecting the accident train to be about 15 minutes behind the first number 49. Eventually, that was to be found out to be closer to 12 to 13 minutes. Either way, though, those in charge at the station apparently didn't feel that it was too close or that they had to move with too much urgency as those two trains were still sitting on the main track. And there really wasn't any special accommodation being made for the accident train that was incoming. With the fog thick and the night dark, the second train emerged, and a train can't stop on a dime. So with truly no warning of any significance, the engineer and fireman of the accident train jumped just before the collision took place. Before they did, though, they did try to ease up on the speed, but it was already too late. The train that had been full of happy and excited travelers crashed into the locomotive that was on the main line. If you were in the front of the accident train, you were going to take the brunt of the punishment. The train was described as telescoping, but reading everything about the incident, I think maybe accordion would be more apt. While both a telescope and accordion can stretch out or be pushed back together, given the size of the trains, I think accordion is a little more of an apt description. If you were in those first cars and had actually survived the initial impact, there was quickly more danger in store. Coal had been used to stoke the steam engines. And while steel was used in the manufacturing of the trains, there was still quite a bit of wood used, which soon became ablaze after the hot coals ignited them. There was no less than six different fires. And though this is something that we wouldn't even think about today if something like this were to occur, but at this particular time, Gas was being used to light the lights that were used on the train. These tanks exploded about five minutes after impact. And if there's anything that we can use regarding this incident that can be preceded by the word thankfully, it's that the sleeper cars were at the back of the train. So while those in the very front were injured fatally. The passengers had been jolted awake, but really did not suffer any major injuries. Many of them were able to step out of the passenger cars to see what had been going on and why they stopped, along with, after realizing what was going on, at least trying to help their fellow human being hearing the agonizing cries coming from the trains and the wreckage 
but soon they knew that nothing could be done. Those cries turned to silence. A resident of Del Mar, Charles Smith, who was working at the railroad at the time, heard the crash and grabbed an axe. So apparently he either just knew or had been trained on what to do in such a situation. He found a car that seemed to have at least one person inside, and he started smashing at the train car with the axe. And he found that he was actually at the baggage car. So those who were in the baggage car were the animals that had been traveling. This included Trixie and Trixie's trainer, Lewis Brockway. Trixie had actually fallen on her trainer, and Charles Smith had to use everything he he had in him to try to free Lewis from being trapped by this massive animal. He was somehow able to pull Brockway out before the gas tanks exploded. Other railroad workers rushed to the scene, hearing the same gut-wrenching cries of the men trapped in the trains. Because the collision happened in the early morning hours, not too many people were awake in the town except those who were working at the rail yard. And as quickly as they sprang into action and they felt the need to call for assistance, they realized that there really wasn't much that could be done. Doctors from the surrounding neighborhoods were called, but once they got there, they could try to comfort and meet some of the needs of the passengers. But as far as the men who had really been injured in the crash, it was probably already too late. Given the scope of the tragedy, two different units, the Del Mar and Salisbury Fire Departments, came to the accident. And we have to remember that this was not a time with high-pressure hoses that could help get a fire under control in a faster manner. It actually took until morning had broken, and that was the quote that was used in one of the articles. So there's not a specific time, but we can probably assume since it happened around 2.50 in the morning that it was at least four to five hours before the fire could be under control. While those were trying to put out the fire and anticipating the possibility of another crash, A train engine was coupled with the Pullman or sleeper cars that had been attached to the accident train, and they were able to actually pull them over to safety so that they were not in the direct path if another train was coming. The engineer of the second train, the accident train, Benjamin Ewing, and the fireman, Henry Esham, were limited in what they could see when they had approached the tracks in Del Mar that morning. Ewing, though, knew that they were getting close to Del Mar, and he had started to slow, but no switches had been pulled to redirect the train. No warnings had been given. Nothing could have prepared them for the sight of stationary train lights coming into view, but by the time they saw those lights, it was far too late to do anything about it. The first two cars of the accident train were destroyed. All of those killed were employees of the railroad. John McCready was the baggage master. John Wood was a mail clerk. Harvey Wilhelm weighed the mail. W. Oliver Perry was a messenger. William Cochran was another mail clerk. George Davis, though an engineer, was catching a ride on the train. He's actually from my hometown and had caught the train in Seaford, so he wasn't actually working at the time. He was supposed to take over, though, um, after the train had departed from Del Mar. And there was another clerk named R.M. Davis that was also killed. All men, with the exception of one, was living on Del Marva with only William Cochran living in Philadelphia. So it's still pretty close to Delmarva. R.M. Davis had recently been married, and though he was from Philadelphia originally, 
his wife was from Dover with his new father-in-law being a businessman in the community. The fire burned so high and long that a description of the remains said that one man was effectively cremated. This particular train and locomotive, this express train, as it was called, also included a mail and baggage car, three regular day coaches or coaches that you may see in older movies where people are sitting and able to move about the train, as well as at least six sleeper cars. There was then a total of 11 cars on this train. When all was said and done, they found that seven people had been killed, along with many of the animals traveling that night, including Trixie. There was some conflicting information in one article that I read. Um, That article said that the following day, another person was pulled from the rubble with the train still smoldering. However, this is only mentioned in one article and in every list that I found of those that were killed, there were only seven names listed, not eight. However, This one particular article did make it sound like there was an eighth person. What I think may have happened is the railroad knew that there were seven people missing. And even though they had not located all of the bodies, they realized that there were going to be seven fatalities and reported that to the newspapers. And then when the last remains of one of the people was found, then the newspaper thought it was an additional person. So again, that's only mentioned in one, but I just wanted to clarify that in case um, you know somebody did come across that article and compare it to others. You know, I went through a few different lists and it seemed to be seven people um, total in every other location that I read. The superintendent of the Delaware Railroad left on the early morning train. It was a special train coming from Wilmington. And just as a little bit of a side thought, um, you know, if you've listened to previous episodes or listened to the other podcast I do, Mystifyingly Missing, um, then you may have heard me do a few different types of transportation accidents, whether they be aircraft or trains. And when someone is going to investigate you know, one of these accidents, that person usually has to travel by the same means that just had the accident. So, you know, nowadays it's more about trains that, I'm sorry, planes that may have crashed and the NTSB or whatever agency is running the investigation then usually flies to the scene, Um, at least looking at the NTSB, even if the accident occurs in another country, if it involves an American-made plane, or if um, the airline is based out of the United States, then they do travel um, usually, and I can only say usually, with the cooperation of the country that the crash occurred in. But I'm just wondering if it does feel surreal at times that you're going to investigate a tragic incident, yet you're traveling in those same means. And really, you're putting all of your faith in one or more people that will be transporting you. So you have to have faith in the system and the process to get you from point A to point B safely knowing that not too long ago, there was another incident involving that same type of transportation. I know that doesn't really pertain to this particular crash only, but at the same time, it's just something I've always wondered about, um, especially in one episode previously where an NTSB investigative team was on a plane a few miles behind another plane. The NTSB had just investigated one crash, and then the plane 
that was in front of them crashed as well. So they actually saw everything happen. So within two days, this investigative team had investigated one crash and then just witnessed another one happening. So I just can't imagine, you know, what must be going through people's minds when that happens. A coroner's inquest was soon called to begin on Friday, February 26th. The inquest was to take place in the Del Mar Hall, and it was to include 19 people that were called, quote, prominent residents of Del Mar, Laurel, and Seaford, end quote. The crash had occurred in Del Mar, and Laurel and Seaford were the two closest cities or towns in Delaware, um, closest to where the crash had occurred. And in what is now seen as kind of an optimistic thought process, it was hoped that the inquest would be done on the same day. Spoiler alert, it was not. There was an expectation that many people would give testimony during the inquest proceedings. So this too is where I'm thinking that they probably did not anticipate the amount of testimony because otherwise they probably would have realized it would be more than a day. While the inquest was beginning, many people arrived in town to sate their morbid curiosity and walk through the scene of the crash. In some ways, the railroad found it to be a little beneficial in the fact that they actually were transporting people to the area because they wanted to watch the inquest. Also, fortunately, the rails were not damaged, so they were still able to, you know, run the trains as normal. One of the main questions they wanted to answer was, why did the train cars catch fire so quickly? However, it was through the eyewitness testimony of a passenger who had still been awake when the crash occurred, and he speculated that it had been because of the gas from the lighting used on the trains. He stated that he noticed that the train had hit the brakes very suddenly and come to a quick stop. So he realized that something must have happened. He then got off of the train as it had come to a complete stop. And shortly after he exited, he saw that the train cars had caught on fire. The first day of the inquest lasted seven hours, and the jury was not able to come up with an adequate answer to all of their questions at that time. Besides the issue of how the fire started so quickly, they also wanted to find out where the different yard workers were, what their roles were in regards to approaching trains, and the inquest had already brought forward, there were a number of inconsistencies with different testimonies. It was speculated that some of the conflicting information was because some of the witnesses either did not understand the roles of the workers in the rail yard or didn't understand the questions that were being asked. While reading some of the comments about the inquest, there was one line in an article that, to me, seemed condescending and snide. Again, that's just my opinion, but when saying that the jury could not come up with a verdict at that time because of inconsistencies and, you know, the responses given to some of the questions, the newspaper said that the questions were plainly asked kind of insinuating that the witnesses didn't understand or didn't get what had happened. However, I think that we have to realize that some of the people giving testimony were not people who worked on the railroad. They were passengers who really just put their faith in those who did work on the trains to get you know, them from point A to point B safely. So their understanding of what an individual's role may be was different than possibly what it actually was. So I think to hold people who were not in you know, the same field of work, who hadn't you know, worked 
in any type of engineering or um, and any aspect on a train before, you know, they wouldn't quite understand if a question was asked in a very technical manner. And I believe some of them were based on some of the testimony that was reprinted in some of the articles. Another thing that I want to mention is the number of sections or trains that were involved in the incident. When I first found information about this crash, the article stated that there were three trains involved, that the train had been broken into three different sections. And that was from a more modern um, article or recounting of the crash. However, up until this point, there's only been discussion about, you know, the first number 49 and the accident train. So theoretically, what was supposed to happen is these two trains, the first number 49 and the accident train, were supposed to get to Del Mar. And one of the locomotives or engines on the main line was supposed to be attached to the first number 49 and then the second locomotive to the second number 49 or the accident train. From that point, they would go to Salisbury over about six mile of track and be joined together as one. And some of the other cars may have been repositioned or um, attached to a different engine. So there were some inconsistencies in exactly how that was supposed to work. So at this point, I'm kind of wondering why it was taking so many steps to actually get these trains um, to where they needed to go. Why did they need to change the locomotives? And that really came down to the end of the railroad system, at least who owned that railroad system. Del Mar was the end of the line for that particular railroad company. Then another company was to pick up. So that meant that they needed another locomotive or engine to be pulling the trains. So to give you an idea of how I usually look at um, research is I'll usually read kind of an overview of an article or um, you know, information based on a certain event. I'll then go through archive sources. And once I found, you know, a lot of information on the incident, I will then kind of arrange it in chronological order of when the contemporary articles or the articles that were made at the time came out. That way I'm kind of following it in the same order that the public would have been reading about it. So just looking at it in this point in time before there's any questions asked at the inquest or any reports of that, the articles now are just kind of describing what was supposed to happen. So maybe it's because I'm looking at it from a 2023 perspective, but I was kind of wondering why was it only the engine that needed to be changed? Was it because the certain workers could only work on certain engines? Otherwise, why didn't all the passengers have to leave? Because theoretically, you know, those passenger cars would have been owned by a different railroad. So wouldn't they have had to get off the train and go on to another? And if not, then why couldn't there be some type of leasing system or royalty system in a way where just no locomotives, no engines needed to be changed, just the other railroad may have needed to pay a certain fee per mile to, you know, ride on those particular tracks. It just seems like a lot easier um, than to try to keep uncoupling and coupling trains, making sure everything is connected properly, um, you have to make sure that the air brakes are all connected properly as well. There's just a lot of steps. And with each step, there's an increased risk of something happening. And as we see here, there were quite a few steps 
in the whole process. And that led to disaster, which we'll see a little bit more about in a few moments. And, you know, I have never worked on a railroad. I've never really traveled by rail, but, you know, it just seems like there would be something or some process that would be easier than having to connect and reconnect trains to you know, make it more expedient for the passengers as well. The next thoughts that I had were about any type of warning system that they may have had to alert an incoming train that there were other trains on the track. Um, and that in itself was a question that the coroner's inquest sought to answer. Noah Lear was a switchman at the Del Mar Railroad that night, or rail yard. It was stated in a news journal article on February 27th, the day after the inquest began, that his testimony conflicted with other witnesses. And his testimony, though, while reading through it, showed that he was acting on assumptions. Now, there were a number of different witnesses, and usually their testimony was you know, pretty short. It was just what did they observe that night? But also, there were people called who worked for the railroad that would describe the different roles that the different um, employees played in the whole process. So the only two testimonies that I'm going into detail on are Noah Lear, as he was the switchman. And I will also be going over the testimony of what was called the yard master, so the supervisor, um, named A.S. Hurt. According to Lear, the yardmaster, Hurt, had told him not to hold up passenger trains unless he had been specifically told to do so. As he had not been told to hold up the accident train, he let it through. He didn't check to see if there was any conflict, but as the trains were running on time, he made the assumption that everything was fine since he had not been told to hold it up. Adding to his testimony, he said that Yardmaster Hurt had actually called him to let him know that the number 49 was coming, and I'm sorry, the accident train number 49 was coming and it was on time. Since Hurt did not mention that there were any special instructions at that time, Lear just assumed that everything was fine. He knew that the first part of the 49 had come through and had been waiting. But again, throughout his testimony, he reiterated he had not been told specifically to hold up the accident train. When asked if he could see the track from where he was to confirm if there was anything on the tracks, he said that he could not see it. He also said that he could not see the red light, which was supposed to be at the rear of an engine. And so I'm just going to cut through a lot of the math that was involved in describing where he was. But basically, he was 400 yards away from the trains that were on the main line. He had specifically mentioned looking for the red light. However, Every description of that night slash very early morning had described it as very foggy. Additionally, as the trains are running, they produce steam from the boilers. You know, the engines run on steam, so that added to the lack of visibility. So it is possible that the lights were on, but just looking at it from that distance, it wasn't able to be seen through everything else that was going on. Also, he was asked how long had he worked that day, and he had worked about 12 hours. Today, we know more about fatigue and also something called circadian rhythms, and this is really like your body's biological clock, and it has been found that people's circadian rhythms, I'm sorry, circadian rhythms um, really are set to be asleep at two or three in the morning. So that can also play a factor in fatigue, and I have seen that mentioned in a number of different types of accidents. So again, looking at it from the 2023 standpoint, 
I do have to wonder if any of those factors played a role in the accident as well. We're next going to go to Yardmaster Hurt's testimony. Um, he did testify that he had been told about the multiple sections of the number 49 and that he was supposed to make up an extra train containing 10 cars plus the engine. So this is you know, probably where that whole beginning of a third car or third train, I'm sorry, comes into play. So he had that added on to the fact that he needed to change the engines of the two trains that were already established. In one piece of testimony that contradicted what most witnesses had already testified to, Hurt said that the side rail or, you know, the the part of the tracks where another train is redirected, if, say, they're waiting on something, he said that that was only supposed to be used for storage, that a double track or double line had been um, constructed to allow two trains to be on the track. Um, however, every other piece of testimony was saying that, no, the first number 49 was kind of on the side track or the side rail. Then in direct and obvious contradiction of what Lear had been um, stating in his testimony, he said that the train should not have been let through unless Lear had specifically been told it could go through. So we have Lear who's saying that he was told to let passenger trains go and less specifically told not to. Then you have Hurt saying that Lear should not have let any passenger trains go through unless he had specifically been told to let them go through. So these, you know, these testimonies are in direct opposition of each other. In a statement that I did find enlightening in terms of kind of the attitude of A.S. Hertz, he was asked about whether or not Lear knew about the multiple trains or multiple cars. And Hertz's response was that Lear didn't need to know. So to me, that kind of reflects his opinion of either Lear individually or possibly the role that he played in the rail yard. Really, he was one of the most important people there as, you know, he kind of directed the trains and where they would go. So to say that he didn't need to know it, that at least, at the very least, is condescending. At the most, it just shows total disregard for what people needed to know in order to do their job safely. Furthermore, in testimony where the jury was trying to look at the speed of the train coming in. Hurt was asked if he knew who he would report violations to. So let's just say he had seen a train coming through and it was obviously going too fast. It was supposed to go at the most six miles per hour through the yard. So if there had been anybody that violated that, Hurt did not know who to report that to. So even if there had been violations of certain regulations in the past, where would they have been reported to if the yardmaster himself didn't know where to send those violations? Much of the previous testimony had been involving the first number 49 and the accident train. So now the jury went back to the trains or engines that were sitting on the main line and their next question was about how those particular engines were protected. And Hurt said basically the firemen that were aboard those engines were supposed to be the flagmen for those engines as they waited on the track. So this means that the firemen would then need to get out, um, keep an eye out for oncoming trains, and then flag those trains down if there were any you know, conflicts or issues. There were just so many things wrong with this process that I don't even know where to begin. But there was really no um, systematic set of rules for these flagmen to follow. 
first, there was no minimum or maximum distance that they needed to be. So you could have a flagman who thought that there was not supposed to be a train coming for hours and may not have been paying close attention. Um, he wasn't you know, far away from the train or his engine. He wasn't far enough away to be able to flag down an approaching train and give that train enough time to stop. So with these lack of regulations, theoretically, the flag man could be, you know, only 400 yards in front of his engine. And there's no way that most incoming trains would be able to stop. But without this regulation, the the fireman slash flagman may not have realized how important it was to give the trains, you know, more than adequate time to stop. Also, without these regulations in place about minimum or maximum distances, the incoming trains would not have known approximately when to start looking before they approached the rail. Would they need to start looking, let's just say 1,200 feet before the train um, or hitting the rail yard? Would they need to start looking three or four miles ahead? There was really nothing to say where the flagman should be and where the incoming train should start to look for that flagman. On this night too, we have to remember that it was foggy. So a flagman may not have actually seen another train approaching and vice versa. So there were other factors just besides the very unsystematic or unregulated way that these flagmen were supposed to you know, maintain the protection of the engines. And now in what I think is probably the most egregious part of this whole situation with the flagmen is they had to fend for themselves. And that's really what Hurt's testimony um, portrayed. So the question posed to him was, you know, when the flagmen were out there waiting for incoming trains, were they told about any information of what trains should have been approaching? And Hurt replied, no, that they had to depend upon themselves or somebody else for the information. So they didn't get a report at the beginning of the day saying, you know, these are the trains that are running. They didn't get updates if a train was running behind or was running ahead of schedule. So they had to actively take a role in hunting down this information. So it's not even something that they would be able to wait at the engine and be able to figure out. You know, they couldn't just bring out a cell phone and call into the office and ask what trains were scheduled to be coming. They would have to go by foot, which means, you know, if they, if they enter the office, they're leaving that train unaccompanied, which just leads to the possibility of, you know, someone or another train hitting that particular engine. So there was just absolutely no rhyme or reason about how things were done when it came to Flagman. Hurt was approaching the end of his testimony and to hit upon the last few um, important points of his testimony, he was asked about what different lights meant. And he said that if approaching train saw a red light, they must stop. If it's a green light, they have to pretty much be on the lookout for a train um, that is ahead of them. And if it's a white light, then the track is clear. Um, he also kept reiterating that he had not given Lear the orders to not stop a passenger train. He said that it would have been foolish of him to do so because if he said that all freights had to be stopped, meaning all freight trains, yet he was just going to allow passenger trains to pass without stopping, then it ran the risk of a passenger train hitting a freight train that was already stopped on the tracks. So that did make a lot of sense. About this particular evening, he said that he didn't know that the train was on time and he was positive that Lear would hold the passenger train up. 
He said he was positive about that. And in testimony that somewhat contradicted himself, he said that if he had any type of doubt that you know, there could possibly be danger, he would have called over to Lear and let him know. However, when he was asked if he had ever called Lear in the past, Hurt said no, that Lear had always called him. Now, this contradicted Lear because Lear said that Hurt had called him, yet Hurt was saying he never called Lear before. Additionally, because he said if there was doubt, he would have called Lear. But then again, in the next sentence, said he had never called him in the past. It was Lear that had called him. There's just really a lot of confusion with the consistency or inconsistency of the testimony that was being given. On March 15th, the jury reconvened for the last time. And there were some other articles just kind of sprinkled throughout um, the newspapers between the original inquest date and here. Um, and you can tell by the dates, it took more than two weeks um, for the jury to come with a, up with a verdict. Um, the jury had also met the evening before for about three to three and a half hours on March 14th. However, that was a secret session. So information that was discussed was not mentioned in any type of article. Ultimately, they found that no one individual was at fault. And I completely agree with that. It was more of a systemic issue. Earlier when I shared my thoughts about how complicated the whole process seemed, you know, again, it was at a time where I had not gotten yet to the verdict, but just looking at everything that was happening, there just seemed to be almost chaos at the time. The verdict itself stated, quote, said wreck, in our opinion, according to the evidence, was caused by the unsystematic manner in which the said yard is conducted by the Delaware Division of the Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington Railroad Company, end quote. So we may never really know if Noah Lear was just following orders and allowing passenger trains to pass without stopping. We don't know if Hurt and his testimony that contradicted this if he felt like he was really telling the truth, if that's what occurred, we have to consider that there may have been miscommunication between the two and each one was acting on the assumption that they were doing the right thing. There you know, was not anything that was computerized where rail workers could see that there were trains sitting on the track or sensors that would automatically cause the train to stop. There were only two men who were in that yard who really know what happened, but will still never be able to answer the why specifically. Was one man in the wrong as far as what he was supposed to do? Were both men in the wrong? Or was it one of those situations where everything just happened at the same time, which led to this tragedy? But I really feel that so much more could have been done to stop this accident. Just very basic communication seems to have been lacking. And understanding that fog can play a huge role in visibility and you know, what they should be doing to you know, make adjustments to be able to get information to different trains to try to avoid this type of accident. And it really seemed like nobody was looking ahead and taking into account other factors that could be playing a role. And everything just unfortunately fell into place where it led to this accident. The men who were working there that night should have never died. This accident to me was solely or wholly preventable. And you know, seven men died just trying to work to, you know, keep their family, you know, with a roof over their head, with food to eat, you know, to stay warm in the winter. 
And, you know, they should not have died just being out there trying to do their jobs. In the weeks and months that were around this incident, there was a lot of reporting about trains in the news. Probably some of the biggest um, information that was reported in newspapers was about the upcoming inauguration of President Taft. So yes, this was happening in March. Um, Now we're used to it happening in January, but this was occurring in March and many different railroads had special trains or specials to take people to the inauguration. They were expected to be about 30,000 people attending. So even from Wilmington, there was a special train that cost $4.40. You could also get other amenities, such as getting a sleeper car that would transfer you to and from the inauguration events. Articles were written about where exactly Taft was when Taft went through Wilmington. So, you know, the actual transportation by train was detailed, and we probably would not see that today as other people actually boarded the same um, train car that Taft would be traveling in. Now, the people who did board it um, seemed to be prominent, what they call prominent members of society, such as one was a doctor and his wife. Um, I believe one was a judge and his wife. So today we would not see a sitting president just kind of traveling by train with people getting on and off. There would be a matter of protection, which they did say there were two people protecting Taft on this train. However, there were some major issues with the whole um, inauguration. First, there was a very severe blizzard on March 4th. Now, being from Delmarva, we don't get a ton of, ton of snow. And D.C., you know, really isn't that far away from us, Um, maybe about two, two and a half hours, again, kind of depending on driving and traffic conditions. And a lot of times the weather can be very similar, though they do tend to get more snow or winter weather. However, to be happening in March 4th with the description of the storm as there was rain, thunder, lightning, snow, sleet, and slush. This was all reported by one of the newspapers about the events of Inauguration Day. This brought down telegraph wires as well and the poles. So poles actually fell across the track. And with lightning going on, you couldn't have people going out to try to clear up the tracks from the debris and from things that had fallen down upon it. So these trains were trapped coming from both directions. Um, Then something that nobody probably would have thought would have become an issue is as they were stuck, they were running out of food. You know, I'm sure that the train cars probably thought that they would restock once they hit Washington, but they weren't at Washington. They were waiting to try to get there. Now, if there happened to be anybody nearby who was selling food, they could try to purchase food from them. However, there were some pretty significant price markups, even without the blizzard, even just within the um, the city itself or district. You know, people pretty much said they were being price gouged. We see that today. Um, So they did a comparison that a meal that would have cost anywhere between 30 and 50 cents in Wilmington was now being marked at a dollar to a dollar 50 while approaching the inauguration. And the inauguration actually did have to be or did have to be held inside. And as we usually see today, it's held outside. The weather conditions were just so bad they had to move it indoors And that made, I'm sure, the 30,000 people who were descending upon the district very upset that they could not see what they had come to watch, basically. In another train incident, a young girl was killed when there was an engine malfunction on a train in Montreal. Now, this, all of these events happening on this particular um, accident 
just seem amazing, but it does show the force and strength of, you know, a train engine. A plug, quote, blew out of the engine, end quote, but the force of this actually threw the engineer clear from the train. Left on board the train, the firemen tried to stop it, but found that the train or the train brakes were actually not working. So it was pretty much uncontrollable at that point. The train did crash through a number of different barriers and in the process actually ended up going through a brick wall of the station. It also crashed through granite walls and the floor of a waiting room. That waiting room was called the ladies waiting room and between 18 and 20 people that were in that room were injured enough that they had to go to the hospital. So initially when the accident happened, we knew of the one little girl that had been killed. However, subsequently um, after this event, those that were hospitalized did not all make it through though. The engineer did later die of his injuries along with another woman and another child. So that put the total at four dead, two adults and two children. There was also an accident in England on February 4th in 1909, and that killed two people and injured a third. So while looking at these accidents, one might be inclined to think about how dangerous it was to travel by rail. And while yes, it does seem that way in just these particular articles, um, you know, going out throughout about a month to month and a half time period. But again, looking at things through a 2023 perspective, many people are killed each day on the roads of America driving. So probably to put it in comparison, still traveling by train could have been a safer option than traveling by car or bus once those became more readily available. Just like today, um, you know, how I mentioned about the um, investigations of a plane crashes, whenever there's a crash or incident involving any type of mass transit, so train, planes, buses, um, bridge failures, everything like that is investigated thoroughly to make sure it doesn't happen again. And we hear about these major issues on news, we get articles into our email inbox to let us know when these types of things happen. But those on the smaller scale where one or two people die in a car crash, yes, there's an investigation. And if there's, say, an obvious flaw in manufacturing that can lead to um, potential failure or other injuries, that is brought up and recommendations are made. But the ones that we really hear about are the mass transit, the commercial traveling, and um, when things go wrong. Those investigations can last for years and years and years sometimes. And the sole purpose is to make that traveling safer. And while we've come a long way from you know, these trains being used to you know, go across the country or even just a few states away, Today, we would most likely fly or drive with the knowledge that there are many rest stops where we can get gas and stretch our legs, where that was not really an option at this time. But overall, it does seem as though it was a safer option than you know, people trying to drive. Plus, if you've seen pictures of the cars from this time period, they did not look comfortable at all. And if it was cold outside, such as the description of the inauguration, there's really not a way I think that most people would want to travel by car in that manner. It was usually a pretty open design, so they would be freezing. And the last thing to look at as far as outcome of this crash was about any compensation given to those who were impacted by the crash. Nowadays, there would probably be multiple lawsuits with either each individual family of each victim 
suing the railroad um, or anybody else that they may see as playing a role in their loved one's death to try to make up for the fact that they no longer had that income. You know, at a minimum, they needed to make sure that they could keep the roof over their children's heads. You know, these were widows who were at a time where there weren't as many options for them to go out and get a job to try to support their family. Plus, if their spouse or loved one had been killed while working, there should have been some type of compensation for that as well. Things didn't always quite work like that back then. So the only lawsuit that was actually written about was when the wife or ex-wife, because she's actually kind of both at this period of time, when Josephine Wood, who was the ex-wife or wife of John Wood, filed a suit to try to get funds from the railroad to compensate her for the death of her child's father, her husband slash ex-husband. This is where things get interesting and explains why I'm saying husband slash ex-husband. Things definitely were quite a bit different back then. Their son was born in 1902, but they actually separated in 1906. Josephine Woods was living with another man, and they did intend to be married at some point in time. However, they had to go through the divorce or go through the divorce proceedings, and a judge would need to file a divorce decree. And eventually, he did. Um, allow a divorce decree, which took place in November of 1908. However, there was a clause in that which stated that she could not remarry or either one of them couldn't remarry until at least one year had passed. So if we're looking at November of 1908, when the decree was made, it was far less than a year between that time and when the accident occurred. So Josephine employed the help of her attorney who filed to have the divorce decree nullified, which he was successful in doing. This then would make Josephine John's widow, not his ex-wife. Eventually, she was given $2,000. Wood's salary was approximately $1,100 a year, and she and her attorney were hoping that If a jury saw a widow compared to an ex-wife, especially given the views at that time, that they could have received more support and more payment. Now, the article where I read this almost describes her as being a gold digger. I admit there were some things in the article that did not really paint her in a great light, such as there were periods in time where The Woods' son lived with other family members in Washington, D.C., and he wasn't in her custody. So at that point, she really wasn't paying much for his upkeep or care. But $2,000, while significant in those days, she still had to pay her attorney fees on top of that. So you have to wonder, how much did she really make? And can we really blame her for trying to make sure that her son is provided for? This was not a time of social support systems such as um, food assistance or heating assistance. So to a degree, they each had to do what they had to do um, to get proper compensation, which I don't feel happened here. It just really seems like the employees' loved ones were brushed off. The last thing that I'll mention about the case itself, though, is insurance settlements and payouts. So I just went over the last case, or the only one actually that was printed about, but there was a rumor that the insurance company um, for Trixie, the educated horse, that was killed in the train crash. And The rumor was that because of the potential earnings that Trixie had throughout her lifetime, that the settlement that her owners got from the insurance company could have actually been more 
than the amounts that Josephine Woods or any of the other members of different families would have received. So a pony or horse, most likely, if those rumors are to be believed, and I want to make it clear that they're rumors, that a horse would be given more worth than a human being's life. And while I do love animals and I love horses, and it just pains me to think how terrified they must have been in the crash, it just really seems that Josephine didn't get as much as I think her son deserved. Okay, everybody, here ends today's episode. I did get a new microphone over the past week. Um, I use like this rebate or coupon service, like whenever I um, place orders online and I get rebates back. And with all of those points and um, the amounts I had saved, I was able to get a better quality microphone. I did actually record this last night, but I don't know why um but the volume was all over the place even though I didn't change anything but one word would be really low and you couldn't hear it and then the next sentence was so so loud so I came back in on Tuesday to re-record and so far it looks like the recording has stayed more consistent and more clear so I hope this does help um, as far as like eliminating background noises or those pops and things like that I do really appreciate everybody tuning in to listen. I find research on about any topic pretty fascinating. And maybe it's because I am not the greatest at physics or mechanics or anything like that, that I find stories about this so interesting to see what happened or what system may have broken down, you know, in order for an incident to occur. And in this case, it just kind of seems like they lucked out in a lot of sense that probably similar events had happened in the past, but they were just lucky enough that, you know, when a second train approached, those locomotives had already moved, whether by design or just by chance. So it was, you know, like I said, pretty interesting to get to read through the different articles. And I really come up and see a lot of interesting things and look at how reporting was done back in 1909. Even, you know, in some of the other cases going back further than that, that on the same page, you could have articles talking about war in another part of the world. And on the next line, it's, you know, saying that somebody checked into this hotel. And I'm not joking. I've been through newspapers that actually report when somebody checks into a hotel. So it's it's really amazing to go through and see the different articles and, you know, how different people lived and what they reported on at the time. I even accidentally came um, upon something that happened with my family. My mother had mentioned it in the past, and I was just scrolling through something completely different and happened to catch my name, my last name, in an article. And it was like, oh. Well, I guess I now have proof about what my mother had once said. So that was pretty interesting, too. So I just appreciate the opportunity to share these stories and to do the research um, because I do find it so interesting. And I'm really thankful and grateful that, you know, other people do find these stories as interesting as I do as well. So with all of that being said, I hope everybody has a great rest of your week. Um, and that you're having a good start to 2023. And I will talk to you all again soon. Bye.